Alrighty. Thank you everyone for your patience. I'm really sorry that things are running a bit behind today and we really, really appreciate you sticking around to, um, to see our, us talk about the French canals. Um, I'll just quickly introduce ourselves for those of you who don't know. Hang on, Nick, wait. Yeah, yeah. yeah. slide. There we go, there's us. Um, okay, so my name is Teresa and this is my partner Nick. And uh, today, you should already know this if you're sitting here, but we're going to do, what's wrong? Can you hear me? More volume. I'll hold it here. Good? Okay, thank you. So today, obviously, we are going to be talking about our time in the French canals. So a little while ago, a few months ago, we uh, took our sailing boat through the French canals and uh, we thought that might be a cool thing to talk about because it might not be something that many of you have thought about before, that was even possible, um, that maybe you didn't know much about how to do that. So we thought that could be an interesting subject to talk about. So thanks for coming along and uh, hopefully this will be an interesting session. Who knows? Who knows? That's the idea. <laughs> <laughs> Slide. <laughs> okay, so hopefully uh, you're all relatively familiar with the uh, geography of France. This is France. And uh, the picture on the other side, the yellow picture, is a schematic of the French canal system. So it's quite extensive and that only shows the very basics. The canals also reach into Belgium and Germany and the Netherlands as well. So there's an entire waterway system in Europe, which is, um, I mean, you could spend years, and we met people who do spend literally years of their life just going through the European waterways. I mean, it, you know, it's a completely different way of boating and something that we're really interested in. So we decided to focus on the Canal du Midi and the Canal de Garonne, which are the two canals that uh, connect the Mediterranean to the Atlantic Ocean. So, <laughs> so we got a lot of questions when we announced that we were going to do these two canals about why were we doing the canals. It just seemed like a lot of work and for what? Surely we could sail it. You know, we've got a sailing boat, we've got sails on our boat, we could just sail around, surely. Our goal is worth mentioning was that we were on the Spanish coast around here and our goal was to get back up to the UK. So that obviously... Hi. I don't know. Matt, uh, where's Matt? Matt's, Matt? Matt's not here. I can't raise the screen. Um, the scope for going wrong is huge. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry for those of you who can't see the screen. We'll just have to leave it the way it is. Um, so yeah, so we had to get back up to the UK somehow. So we had two options. We could either go through the canals, obviously that's what we chose in the end, or we could sail around. And this is what I want to draw your attention to because this was the alternative. And this is what most people choose to do, either because they have restrictions around the sailing boat that they have, or because it's easier and it's, it can actually be quicker despite the fact that it's more in terms of distance. So we would have had to sail through the Strait of Gibraltar, which is, uh, it can be challenging enough just on its own. And then we would have had to sail north along the Portuguese coast. And you can see by the little arrows, that, that is actually against the prevailing winds. And the prevailing winds are really well established along this coastline. Um, so there was no real chance of escaping them. You know, it wouldn't be a matter of waiting for a weather window. Those weather windows do not exist. You, the prevailing winds are northerly winds in this particular part of um, the world. So you would have two options. You can either motor in the mornings, and winds are generally lighter in the mornings. You could motor in the mornings and then duck in in the afternoon, perhaps motor overnight when the winds are a little bit lighter as well. Or you could sail out to the Azores, which are situated probably around here. That's a, about an 800 mile sail. We did it in, in the other direction. It took us a week. It wasn't particularly pleasant, I have to say. And, uh, and then north to the UK, uh, across the, the Bay of Biscay, and that was the alternative option. So, you know, and that would have added, obviously, quite a few miles onto the journey. Slide. 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 Are we serving donuts? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give him a chance to speak in a moment, don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, so just a couple of numbers to throw at you. Obviously the red is the canal route. It's a rough canal route. 
um, that we ended up taking, and that was the equivalent of 226 miles. The canal system actually works in kilometers, which was something that we had to wrap our heads around as well, but we'll stick to miles. 226 miles versus the most direct route would have been a 2,000 mile sail. So people were saying, why go through all the trouble of going through the canals? That was one very good reason. And this was the other. We were inspired to do the French canals by um, Distant Shores. And I don't know who many, do many of you follow Distant Shores? Yeah, lots of, yeah. Round of applause for Distant Shores, definitely. Uh, they, no, 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 I'm assuming not, they've not put their hand up. No, so we, um... <laughs> both, both here in that yeah. yeah, they're here at the show, yes, they are here at the show. You'll find them probably at the Discovery Stand, Discovery Sutherland Stand. So they did the French canals in um, a southerly, a larger southerly than what we have. It's, the out is worth mentioning our boat is a southerly, that's the type of boat that we have. And Paul and Cheryl from Distant Shores did the French canals in a southerly as well. And so we thought, well, it's obviously possible. And uh, we were inspired by them to, to follow in their footsteps, essentially. We did the, uh, a different canal system to what they did. We did between the, um, the Mediterranean and the Bay of Biscay. And they did between the English Channel and the Mediterranean. So they did a different route. But this was kind of the, the vibe that we wanted. We thought it'd be really cool to go through the middle of the country and it was just something different. It was a challenge and we just, it, the thought of it really excited us. So that's what we decided to do. And now it's the, your turn to talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's look back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I like this side. No, no. Yeah, so uh, uh, I'm Nick, if you don't already know me from the internet. <laughs> Um, firstly, um, apologies for the massive delay. Um, having Delos as our warm-up act, warm act is always difficult. <laughs> so, yeah, so thank you uh, to Delos for the, for the uh, introduction. Um, so the, I think Teresa mentioned distant shores. Um, now this is important for you because I know that a lot of you are planning at some point on doing this, whether it's now in five years or 10 years. Um, and for us, I think the distant shores thing uh, was so important because there were times when we never thought we'd get across the line, get onto a boat and actually set sail. And to keep that dream alive, it was watching their episodes. And that was a decade ago, I think now. So it's 10 yeah. years ago, we did this. Uh, and we used to sit in our flat in London, our apartment, as you say in America, in London, and kind of like watch them and get inspired. And so before I kind of go babbling on about what we did and why we did it, I do want to put across to you, for all of you who at some point want to do this, it is always achievable, and uh, without going into the kind of Mr. Miyagi thing about how, you know, how zen you need to be, uh, you need to keep your own dream alive to do this because there are so many obstacles that you will find that get thrown at you. Uh, normally, it's finances and or family, and if you can try and work your way around those, you can all live this life. So, uh, and I'll probably. Yeah. See you. <laughs> I will point out that Sarah, uh, Sierra from Children's End of Summer, and I have promised her that she could come up and talk if she embarrasses us. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Sierra's going to be singing numbers from Judy Garland, Garland's <laughs> canon, uh, The Pinching to the Wizard of Oz, at the end. So, sorry. <laughs> so, the French canals, um, as Theresa's alluded to, we have a lifting keel boat, and when we had that boat built, we knew that we could only do a canal trip with a, 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 a variable draft boat. And it was an easy choice to make because for those of you who follow us, you know that we're moving on to a different boat and it probably won't have a lift and kill. So this was our last chance to do this. And so we had to set about planning it. And I suppose for a lot of Americans and Canadians, you have a canal system that circumvents the, the <coughs> continent. And so we've seen, we took a lot of it instruction from other sailors and pictures on the internet about how to build um, a set of A-frames and how to prepare your boat for this sort of passage. So this bit is a bit technical and it kind of goes into our thoughts about why we did this and how we went about doing it. And so really it's what we learned uh, works. Um, so building the A-frame is fairly easy to build in timber and there's a lot of instruction on the internet. We went to a French hardware shop um, to buy the timber and there's a few people on YouTube who are like, why are you not using a Japanese skill saw? And I'm like, 
Dude, this is like a French hardware shop. They've got some nails and some wood, so the Japanese saw is never going to happen. But really, uh, our building an A-frame, it's fairly straightforward, and I, there's no point in going into the, the specifications of our A-frame because it was really specific to our boat, but a few things uh, about that A-frame. We overbuilt ours completely, and we used a lot of very, very strong coach bolts um, to build the frame. It is important to put across that more than anything else, it's not so much the strength of the frame, it's how much it moves. And it's the same with any aspect of sailing, it's movement that will fracture the frame. So the, 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 the hints that we took were to secure the A-frame at all points. So it was, it was secured to the deck, and we used our deck cleats to secure the bottom of the frame. The other thing, and probably the most interesting and important thing we learned was to use cargo straps rather than ropes to stop everything moving. So we went and bought a load of, I think they're called ratchet straps in the UK, cargo straps. Things you, you know, to tie down like sheep and stuff on cut and trucks. <laughs> so when we're not strapping down sheep, um, we use them for the boat. So we had about 20, 20 or so of these. And by tightening everything up, you can get zero movement. And there was a point when we were on the, the River Garonne where, um, a container ship or a very big vessel passed us, and the amount of movement was huge. Um, and they do say with anything to do with boating, there is nothing you cannot fix with duct tape. So we have a lot of duct tape, duct tape and a lot of cargo straps, and you can fix anything with that. So for those of you who are getting into sailing, um, whether you're transporting um, a mast on deck or not, have cargo straps available, because you can strap all sorts of things up with us if you hadn't already worked that out. <laughs> so, um, again, Teresa's like been telling me for three days to not go off on a tangent and start talking about our cats or any other aspect of our life that is not specifically to this. So, uh, anyway, point two. <laughs> so, obviously, uh, the thing that we did need to work about is that, obviously, going through a canal, we've got a depth problem to deal with, but I think in... Uh, in a deep, in the shallowest part, we were down to less than a meter, which in America is three foot, yeah, or a yard. But no one really knows it's a meter. Um, but there's also a height problem. We had to go through bridges or under bridges, and everything that um, we had to do was trying to work out the lowest height that we could get through. And for us, that was three meters thirty, um, and we went, measured all that, that all out with uh, the, just by literally taking a tape measure to the waterline. The thing that we have to understand, and it's important if you do this canal system yourself, whether you kind of buy a boat and go to Europe or, or do it in the Americas, is that the boat sits lower in fresh water. And we didn't work this out, so the height has to be taken in fresh water rather than, than salt water. So be aware that there's a difference for us. It was about 20 centimeters, which in American is eight inches. Um, so again, so we had about a three meters 30 clearance, and we measured that all out in fresh water. Um, and then we had to take down all the bits of, from the boat at the wind generator, which was up at about four meters. And so that was, uh, that's, that in itself is not a job that it was difficult, but then when it comes to unstepping a mask, I, I'm not gonna lie to you, I had absolute kittens over this because you're like, it's, it's like the most complicated Lego puzzle in the world and you've got to put it all back together. And if you do it wrong, you know, you, you can have problems. So um, for us, Two things that I would say that are really useful are, well, one thing, but we'll use it for two purposes, uh, modern mobile phones. Firstly, uh, film everything. Don't just take stills of your electric. So we took all the, the sailing panels down and took still photographs, and that's really important, but it's actually really important to take video as well. So if you're ever taking a boat apart or part of a boat and trying to put it back together, use video, because there are so many things you think, when we take photographs, you think you've got everything, but when you come to review it, you're like, I've missed that. But uh, literally the number of frames you've got in a video that moves around, you can get so much more information. So genuinely a tip that I would give you, it, whether it's taking a part of a wind generator, whether it's taking a mast off a boat, or anything to, that has to be put back together in a certain sequence, video it as well as photograph it. That's the first thing um, that's really important with iPhones and Androids. The second point, which I think is saying that we never worked out how useful it was, um, was the spirit level that you get on an iPhone for measuring angles. So from our point of view, when you're trying to put the mast on and you're trying to get it up straight, or you're trying to work out an A-frame, in our case, to get an A-frame straight, the boat, on the trim of our boat sits about one degree to, I think it's one degree to port, just because of the way it's weighted with fuel tanks and everything. And so using a general spirit level on with a little bubble, it doesn't work. But if you've got, if you put a spirit level on an iPhone up against the mast to get a, a vertical reading, 
or to get um, a horizontal reading by putting it on, say, we use the entrance to our companion way because it's completely, that, that we know is level with the boat and it will give you the, it will tell you the lilt of the boat. So we know that ours is one degree. So you just, it's very easy to do it that way. So a top tip, it's, it's on, the, on the new iPhone, it's a, it's a free app, but I think I had an Android before, it's very easy to, to kind of like just download a free spirit level. And that for boating is a really good way, especially if you're installing stuff, and we've used it for installing wind generators, for getting the mast back straight, and for actually when we installed our self-steer, getting, getting it absolutely flush and trim to the boat rather than the horizon. Um, how am I doing for time there? Am I like digressing too much? Okay. So yeah, so um, yeah, so disconnecting electrics all done through video um, and fenders. Now again, whether you do this in an American canal system, a Canadian canal system, or a European system, you are going to need far more fenders than you think you're going to need. Um, we started off with six when we got into the having the mast unstepped. By the time we got out, we had twenty. So there's, and I will run through the reasons why we had twenty. Um, in fact, we stopped on the way and had to buy more. So firstly. Um, going into canals is very different to docking a boat in a, in a, in a pontoon. Most pontoons have like some sort of protection. These canal walls are stone. And for those of you who kind of like have a basic grasp of this, fiberglass doesn't mix too well with stone. Um, and we found that out to our detriment. So firstly, the, the way that we fended the boat, we got two really big ball fenders that are about like two foot wide and put them at the very bow of the boat to protect it. Then we had fenders all the way down the side, but, and this is the thing, when you're trying to dock the boat in, um, on a pontoon, the pontoon is normally at a fixed height to the water. When you're going into locks and the water level goes up and down, the boat will be at different levels to the lock wall when the water's in and when the water's out. So for every fender that you have placed along the side of the boat, you need another one at a different height. So it's important to work, to understand that, you know, Despite the fact you said we've got 20 fenders, we've got two at the front, then we've got two sets of eight at the back, uh, two sets of four, so one high, one low. And at that point, you've only really got five fenders each side, but they're at different levels. So it's important to understand that if you're going into a lock system. Um, and the other thing I wanted to talk about is fender boards, which are really, essentially they're sacrificial boards. And for us, they were just very long. They were three or four meter uh, pieces of wood that we got from a hardware shop. Actually, but they were decking. It was just decking. You, know, you get the ridge decking, which we drilled holes in. And they sit on the outside of the fender. So you have the hull of the boat, then you have the fenders, and then you have the, the, the boards. And what that means is that if you get to, because at times, times you'll go into a marina. Um, even when we were sailing on the east coast of the UK, you don't always get nice, smooth dock walls. Sometimes you get piles that are kind of set into the, into the mud, and your boat will sit against that. So when we, we sail with fender boards, it's like a plank of wood, so we can put the, uh, the fender board on the outside of the pot of the fenders, and literally it, the, the, the boat then sits on the wood. So it's important we had one of those each side, um, and it, it's a good way of protecting, protecting the, the top sides of the boat. So yeah, I think you can just see this. So yeah, the fender board in, in this kind of slide at the bottom, it's a three meter piece of wood that literally just protected our top sides. Um, what did you want to ask me? Yeah, no, it's Yeah, so um, demasting a boat, it, the, the, the yard that we used was absolutely fantastic, and I'm not gonna lie to you, I had absolute chickens about it, I really did. And as with any sailing community, like if you do anything on a boat, um, in a boat yard or in, 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 a, in, a, in a boat yard like this, you will have 20 people coming along telling you you're doing it wrong. And that you're gonna, you know, the boat will catch fire or you're gonna sink the boat if you do it like that. But we did get some sage advice. Um, and the advice that we got that we did listen to was to take everything off the mast, not leave anything on. Um, so, you know, you take the, sh because it's very easy to think, oh, I'll leave the shrouds on, I'll leave, I'll leave the, the forestay on. And really what we did find is you take the forestay off the mast and move it up because the forestay will extend longer than the length of the mast yeah. See, so the force stays there, but normally that, because the, we have a nine tenths rig, it attaches about 10% uh, of the way down the mast, and when it's extended, will be over the end of the mast. Now, a shroud you can replace quite easily, but the force stay, if you've got a furling jib, will have a, it's got a foil on it, um, like a metal runner to take the, the jib. If you bend that, you throw it away. So it, that's probably like the most fragile part of that rig. So um, it took another 10, 15 minutes just to take the shackle move the force day all up and store it all on deck. And again, this was all done uh, with probably 
200 cable ties, um, the uh, ratchet straps. And so basically the only thing that was um, sticking out at uh, the front of the boat was the, the, the base of the mast. Um, and we were very able to protect that using a bucket. Now, literally, it's just buckets and putting a big bucket over the bottom, over the base of the mast, because you are going to knock it. You will knock. The, you will knock the mast, and there's nothing you can do about it. it with the deepest weather, you know, best weather in the world, it, you will end up uh, c colliding with the dock walls. And so, from that point of view, putting a bucket over the over the end of the mast really saved it. And we ended up with absolutely zero damage to the boat, despite the fact that during the, our entry into the canals, there were a couple of Boats that were hire boats that were rented by people who really, really, you know, should have been Stevie Wonder's cousin with their ability to see. You know, that there were some issues where we uh, ended up having a few choice words with people as they collided it. Wait, uh, Teresa, sorry. Teresa was swearing at them while I was <laughs> sipping on my chamomile tea from a. I'm actually somewhere else. So, yeah, so Teresa was swearing at them and I was literally just saying, please calm down. You don't need to, you don't need to, do you don't need to talk like that potty mouth. Uh, so, yeah, so, from, so yeah, protecting the mast, um, not just from um, collision with the dock wall, but from other boaters. Because one thing we have found in the, in the French canal system is that there is no license required to hire a boat at any level. And in fact, one of the companies, I went into the, the office to, to talk to them, and their, their brochure, which was glossy, um, they, there was a big, a big sign, a big kind of like circle on the front of it saying, you need no qualifications for this. And it became bleedingly apparent that these boats, it's like dodgems at the fair, only they're floating and they're full of drunk Russians. So that's, that's where we were with this, I think. Yeah? Is that my bit done? Do okay, I've got to give this up for five minutes, but I promise I'll be back. <laughs> So one of the things that I was really worried about before going into the canal system, and I'm not sure whether Nick was worried about this, I think he had enough on his plate, but I was concerned about going into the locks because I had never, not, neither of us, I don't think, had ever gone through a lock before, maybe, oh, okay, once. But we didn't really know how that would work. We didn't know how to operate that with just the two of us. The one lock that we had been in, we had friends there, you know, helping us. How do you do it with just two people? And we asked people before going to the canals, how do you do it? And it was all a bit vague. And uh, the guidebook gave you a bit of a step-by-step -step instruction of how to deal with it all when it's just, you know, the two of you shorthanded. And we weren't quite sure whether that system would work as well. So it was really through a system of trial and error that we, we came up with um, what worked for us. And of course, when you are entering the uh, canal system, you are going in at sea level and you are with every lock going up a little bit. So you are going in at the bottom of the lock and then as the water rises, you obviously get to the top and you carry on. So that um, actually this, um, this is a video, I'm gonna show you a video in a minute, but you can see from this shot here, Nick, are you paying attention or what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so as you can see, we are going in at the very bottom of the lock and the, the you can see kind of stairs on either side and if I were to stay, Nick was helming the whole time and my job was to get the lines where they needed to be which was around bollards at the very top of the lock wall and as you can kind of hopefully see and you'll be able to see more clearly when I press play, in fact I'll press play right now, or will I, yes I will, is that going? Yeah. Here we are. Uh, this was just taken from a GoPro, it's obviously sped up, you can tell that. Um, so if I were just to stay on the boat, which I don't in this particular occasion I get off, then I would really struggle to lasso the bollards myself, and believe me, I did that several times and it didn't work. So what we ended up doing is I would get off the boat um, in advance, and in this particular occasion I was able to get off immediately before, yeah, so we collided with the high boat. <laughs> Um, I got off immediately before and was able just to hold the bow line as I got off. Um, we had a different strategy for most of the time, which I'll show you in the next video. And so of course I would attach the bow line to a bollard forward and uh, then I would come back and I would take the stern line and, you know, these lines didn't need to be particularly thick, they were just holding the boat in place. Um, and as you can see, oh, there goes the mask. Yeah, so the 
in flux of water was really like there was a lot of water coming into the lock there and it was really strong and it was just impossible to um, keep the boat under any sort of control which is why of course we needed to protect the entire boat particularly the mast um, from any damage because it was inevitable that we weren't going to be able to protect the entire boat from you know colliding with the dock wall this particular lock was a double lock uh, so as you can see we went up and then I walked the bow line through um, to the next lock and we did the whole thing all over again. And we had many double locks and we had triple locks, we had a four lock staircase and we also had a seven lock staircase. And we did the seven lock staircase very early on in um, the entire experience and uh, that was a real challenge. Um, we have a video about it up on our YouTube channel if you wanted to see it, it was pretty intense. Nick did manage to lasso that, which uh, is part of the reason I put that video up because I thought that was really cool. Most of the time I, I took the line from him, but he lassoed that particular line. So his job was to bring the boat in without my help. He had, as you can see, the gate, uh, the entrance to the lock is very narrow, so there's no real room for error. And it was a real challenge for him to do that, you know, without another person on board to, to help fend off or to give him some direction about how close the other side of the boat was. But he, you know, he did an amazing job. And then um, he'd kind of just sit back and relax while I tried to keep the mask off the, the dock wall, which I used the boat hook to do um, for most of the time. And uh, that worked a little bit better. I think in the last clip you saw my like, leg dangling over. That probably looked quite unsafe and maybe it was a little bit unsafe, but uh, my foot's still intact, so it was all good. Um, so that was essentially the way that we did uh, the locks. Did you want to talk about your experience doing the locks? Because you had a different experience, yeah. So I'm going to show you another video. It's, um, again, of us going through a lock, but um, from a different perspective. So I'll let Nick talk through that one. So I, I think, um, did, can someone tell me, does the... Hey, my that's locked up. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know there was going to be any... Uh, Just us cussing at each other in the background. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm not going to play that if there's a... If, where's Matt? Just put it on mute, then. I can't. It's not on my... Um, I don't think it's on okay. my... Um, does the American lock system have any... So does the American canal system have any locks? Is it... Is it yes. So you do have locks to deal with? Yeah. So uh, this is useful just from a technical point of view. Um, the lock keepers in France, depending on how close to lunch it was, would be at various degrees of angry. <laughs> and they are able to control the influx of water. So if they were in a good mood, you get the, the water would come in slowly. But I think as you can see from the first video, sometimes it would come gushing in. And the problem is, especially with the first canal, which was 200 kilometers, the, uh, the, the canal walls are curved and they fit the, that curve just fitted our boat perfectly, which basically meant any movement of the nose of the boat would um, result in us smacking the mast. So we kind of developed a technique for, for kind of stopping that happening. And it's important for those of you who sail, like the, that one technique that we didn't learn straight away when we first started sailing was how to spring off um, and spring onto a mooring. Do you, you all familiar with that? Can we just get a show of hands? Do you all know how to spring out? Okay, so just want to kind of so springing a boat is 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 a technique that you really it's a really easy technique and it's something that when I first started selling I'm like that's just the work of the devil but it's not it's it's easy and it's a very very interesting and useful technique if you're ever stuck on a pontoon or a mooring and you can't get off because the wind is too strong um, and the, the the it's as a as a premise is you essentially take a line uh, one line from either the front or the back. Either the front or the back of a boat forward. So if you've got the line, you take a line from say a stern cleat on your boat to a cleat that's forward um, of that on the pontoon, and you reverse. Or if you've got the if you have a line from the front, the bow of the boat, you take it back to the pontoon and you go forward. And what that does, in the case of say a stern cleat, so just to go through that again, you've got the 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 the, the, the line is from the back of your own boat going forward to a pont, to a cleat on the pontoon. If you reverse, it pulls the nose out. And it is the only way you can pull the nose of a boat out in a, in a wind for our boat over about 15 knots. So it, there are cases, everyone's like, oh, I've got a bow thruster. Your bow thruster just won't touch it. So um, controlling the nose of a boat um, 
or the stono boat using springing technique. And for all those that you've got boats or that you charter boats, I really advise you to just give it a go on a nice calm day because it is so, so easy. My worry was always like, well, what if the line snaps and all of a sudden go careening into the boat behind or the boat in front? It doesn't happen like that. You can't, you actually physically, with a good line, you cannot go any further back. So um, just to, if you, if you haven't really done this, practice it. It is a super easy thing to do and it will get you out of a, a, a load of fixes, just the springing. So in this technique, what we did, because what would happen is as the lock keeper opened the lock gate, you would find that the nose would just, because the influx of water is huge, the nose would just go clanging into the, into the dock wall. So by springing back, literally we'd have the, 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 the life and the stone cleat on the boat going forward. By using the, the throttle in reverse, we could keep the nose exactly where we needed to keep it. And that is, that was a, that was a, I think that was probably the biggest thing that stopped us damaging the, the wall, uh, the, the boat in any way. So yeah, so a um, little bit of homework for you all when you leave here today. Um, in fact, just go and, there's a, there's a couple of oysters. Um, <laughs> just go and say, Nick says you can, can I try springing off? <laughs> so uh, yeah, anything else you want to talk about there, Dave? No, I'll see that one. Two, by the way, that's... Sorry. Oh yeah. Uh, okay, so let's move on from the lock situation and talk about some logistics and costs uh, with you. So a couple of things, another thing that I was kind of worried about and, and uh, preoccupied with before we went into the canals was how are we going to find places to tie up? Like, can we just tie up anywhere or does it have to be an official place or, you know, are there going to be lots of facilities? How much is it going to cost? And it transpired that it was extremely easy because you can literally tie up almost anywhere. There's a few patches that have signs saying, you know, no parking, but you can tie up pretty much anywhere. And that's called nature moorings. So just you take stakes and you put them into the ground and you tie a, a line to them and, um, and off you go. You're not allowed to tie up to any trees, um, of course, but you can just put stakes into the ground, a bit like camping. And that's free or included in the cost of the permit, which was 143 euros per month, which is about 145 American dollars. Um, you didn't get any services, of course, when you just tied up to the side of the bank, and you had to pick your spot. Some kind of sometimes the bank wasn't particularly uh, conducive to to you coming alongside, but most of it was it's relatively well maintained, and and we didn't find too many areas that were too difficult for us to tie up to. Normally, we would try and tie up to somewhere that had services, electricity, and water, um, and obviously you know uh, something to tie to a, a town dock or whatever, and that varied in cost. Uh, the most expensive was in a place called Bezier and uh, that was 20 euros a night and again you get uh, water and electricity and the cheapest was about two euros a night where you didn't have to pay for the dock but you just paid uh, two euros for the electricity. So that was pretty good. Uh, another couple of costs for you, the mast unstepping and stepping, it differed uh, for both for some reason. Obviously the different yards had different prices, but we paid uh, 35 on one end and 120 on the other end. So we thought that was pretty, pretty inexpensive. Although we ended up transporting the mast ourselves, we did look into transporting the mast um, by land, which uh, honestly we probably would have done if it had worked out because as we've just explained, uh, the mast was a bit of an issue for us. And the cost of the transport was a thousand euros. Again, it's a bit expensive, but we thought maybe it would be worth the uh, kind of peace of mind not having to deal with the mast and the overhang. And the only reason we didn't was because the transport company, uh, there's only one or two companies that offer that service and the dates didn't quite line up. So we couldn't get that done in the end. Just some highlights, uh, and this is, you know, the re I can't really put into words why we love the canal so much, because it wasn't so much the places that we saw or, you know, the things that we did. It was really just the overall experience and just the, the feeling that we got from taking our own boat through the middle of a country and a beautiful country at that. Um, so I, I do have a little, I don't know if this is sound. Okay, that's the sound of our brochure. <laughs> But it was actually a lot more serene than that makes a sound. You could hear the birds and you could hear the, um, it was just really quiet and uh, there was always birds in the trees and it was just uh, really serene and really peaceful. 
we obviously, as you can see, I'm stuffing my face with uh, mussels and rosé wine, and that was a regular thing that we did. And, you know, it was just really lovely. We saw some beautiful uh, medieval towns and villages and uh, some beautiful sunsets and sunrises. Just the countryside was gorgeous. So that was just being in France and enjoying, you know, the, the local culture and the people and the, you know, kind of um, serene element of going through the vineyards and the countryside was really special. That was very unusual, obviously, on a sailing boat, and it was a real experience. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the slide is, is a bit of a dry slide, actually. <laughs> Let's get into the logistics of the canals. Um, for those of you who are brave enough to take your own boats, there is uh, there are draft limitations. Um, the draft for us, it's meant to be one and a half meters um, at its shallowest. We found that to be actually not strictly true, uh, and in parts, the centre of the canals were down to probably less than a meter, and the, the the edges of the canals, the banks, sometimes were, you know, waist height in water. So it's it is shallow. Um, would we do it again? Absolutely. Would we do it in our next boat? Absolutely not. Um, so width, width is, um, the canals are actually quite wide in parts, but the narrowest is always the lock entrances. And I think you're looking at about five meters. Now our boat is four meters wide. She's got a fat ass on her. So um, there was a, a little scuff uh, on one of the lock gates, which we've had repaired. But it is a little bit tight, especially if you are trying to get into the lock with another couple of boats. So that is something that you know you do have to be aware of, that you are not on your own. And um, there's nothing quite like going into a lock um, at like one knot when there's a stag party or a bucks party and, like with 10 people on board absolutely shit-faced, kind of like you know, trying to get their, their little uh, hire boat into a lock behind you. Uh, that, yeah, that was a little bit, uh, but yeah, very interesting. So, um, so you, you have to be aware of the dimensions, both of the, the draft of your boat, the width of your boat, and how what your air draft is, even with the, the, the mast on deck. So sailboats, it is actually easy to do it in a sailboat, uh, and we would recommend it. I, I, don't think, um, I don't think I'm embellishing the facts. It was a fantastic experience. Um, as we said at the beginning of the talk, it's something we wanted to do for a long while, and having a lift keel boat, I think it's the only opportunity that we are gonna get in our, in our current boat, the next boat will not be able to do this. I suppose, from the point of view of France being, it is, there are certain places in the world that are exactly what I thought they would be uh, from the pictures, you know, for the actual reality uh, of, of being there. New York City, for instance, is one. You go to Manhattan, it is exactly what I thought it was gonna be, and France was the same. It, it literally is vineyards and, you know, men with onions around their necks, kind of selling wine by the side of the road. It, 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 and we're just like, wow, this is just like, we've gone into a dream. Um, and I, you know, it's 11 o'clock in the morning and we haven't been drinking, so it, it, it is absolutely fantastic. I thoroughly recommend it to all of you that kind of were considering doing this. If not in your own boat, but look at the higher boats. Um, is this one of your next slides? Yeah, okay. So there are many companies that do this sort of thing. Um, they do vary in price from the kind of like the bare boat charter, for those of you who may have chartered in the BBIs or the Caribbean, um, but they're, they're bare boat charters. They are, there's very many different designs. Some look like little barges, little classic barges, and some look like, you know, standard slab-sided uh, river boats. They vary in price, they vary in price hugely, um, and I think really from about five to $10,000 a week US for a, the hire of a boat. But bear in mind, some of those will sleep 10 people. So you're looking at less investment than maybe you know, a week in a week somewhere, you know, in a hotel. You can get um, fully catered luxury barges that I think were well, 35,000 a week to a 20,000. And they are, but for that you get your own butler. So depending on whether a butler is uh, required for a week's holiday, I don't know. We always live a different life, but some people need to be waited on hand and bit. And, but, and they did, but, you know, joking aside, there was a butler. Uh, so yeah, so if that's the kind of thing you want, then absolutely uh, fantastic, uh, and, and go and research those. But it is, a, it is a really fantastic experience, and I suppose the way that Therese and I travel, and I've always traveled, we're always looking for the experience, a, a different experience, and what we've done in Ruby Rose so far has been varied. I mean, last year we crossed the Atlantic in, in our boat, and this year we've gone through the French canals in the same boat, which in some ways is mind-blowing. So um, for us, I think the joy of I would say sailing, but as some smart aleck on the internet said, well, you're not really sailing, are you, if you've got the mast on deck? 
but for, for us, I think one of the real joys of what we do, and I think it's the thing um, that really kind of like inspired me to sail. Because a lot of the question we get asked a lot is, why, what, what kind of gave you the bug, um, the sailing bug? And it wasn't really kind of like cruising along at six knots with the, kind of the wind in your hair and the sun on your face, because really that's such a rare thing to happen. Especially in sailing, you know, 90% of the time you're cold and miserable and you're just trying to get some hot food inside you. Um, but I think for me, one thing that really kind of like inspired me was being able to be in our, in our saloon and look out the window and just see something different each time. So, you know, we've looked out of the same window and seen, you know, we've seen Charleston. We've lived in Charleston for, in South Carolina for a while. We've sailed the Caribbean for a while. And you look out the window and you're sitting in the same cockpit. And that's uh, where we met Billy and Sierra. You know, we, we've had dinner with them in that cockpit. We've had dinner in the same cockpit um, in the middle of Atlantic in a storm. And this was looking out of a window at sheep. Which, <laughs> So yeah, it's, so it's. I think that really, I, as I know, as I said at the beginning of this uh, speech, that uh, a lot of you want to get out there, and there are barriers to all of you doing this because otherwise we'd all do it, and we would all be living on boats now. Um, and I think to, while there are challenges, we always used to try and find things to inspire us, to inspire us to actually set sail, to inspire us to put the problems that we could aside, and. You know, having those different views and being able to look and say, okay, this is absolutely fantastic. That's what keeps you going because it's not always highs. There are lows as well. And that for us, I think I would say genuinely in the last, we've been living on board full time for coming up six years. And we've only had the YouTube channel for two, two of a bit. But it's those little things that keep you going. So I, I can't recommend it enough. I think that it is one of, for me, one of the highlights of everything we've ever done. It really has been a highlight of our, of our travels because it was so different. And we realized that for now, we couldn't do it again, um, not in our boat. I think, Ruby, we've said this openly, Ruby Rose 4 or 5 may be a steel canal boat. Um, I may smoke a pipe and wear a barrel at that point and I'll be wearing a chunky knit, knitted jumper. Uh, so I hope you're still following them when we're telling you yarns from the canals. Uh, but it, it is an absolutely fantastic experience and whether you get to choose to do that in your own boat or a higher boat, I, I can't recommend it enough. So, um, questions. Did <laughs> you do the canals in the UK as well? You can. I think the UK canal system was set up. I, the, the, I suppose they had, they, I don't know how the American system works, or the canal system, but most of the canals in France and uh, the UK were set up to transport goods in a time before uh, the railway networks were fully established. Um, the canals in, in Britain are, to the best of my knowledge, narrower. And so the, the, and the, what gives me uh, evidence for that is that if you look at English canal boats, they are, they're called narrow boats for a reason. They're only seven foot wide. And so for that reason, the locks, I think, are only 15 foot wide. So you would struggle probably in a boat of our size in the English canal system. Plus, we have a slight issue with the fact that our weather is appalling. So, uh, you know, if you like drinking tea in the rain, then yeah, knock yourself out. With that. <laughs> uh, gentlemen at the back, sorry. You can do it with beer. You can do it with beer, although uh, Billy kindly bought me a case of uh, some bush the other day to remind me how my knowledge of American beer is appalling. <laughs> how long were you actually in the uh, we were in there for a month, uh, and really, as we all do, I think it, because we come from a history of saying, and for those of you who sail, we always put these ridiculously unrealistic time, time scales on what we're going to do. We could have stayed in there for two or three years. It is literally that beautiful, and we met a couple, I think in our first week that we were sailing with a Belgian couple with a motor yacht, and we, we were out in a month, and I think only last week we left. At the, we met them at the beginning of May, and they have done 14 kilometres since we left them. So <laughs> it really is, you know, you take it at your own pace. And they they are living their best life. They're retirees, I think, in their 60s, and they, they very open about like, we, what is the point of going any faster? It's beautiful. They will stay in, in, in a mooring for um, sometimes a month, and they they're wintering in the canals. And I suppose uh, the other thing about it is, 
for all of you who are fortunate enough to be able to take vacation away from the standard vacation, so spring break and summer break, being able to see these canals outside of high season when people have more time to talk to you, where you can see a rural life or a, the life that uh, local people are living at a more relaxed pace is something that uh, it's really nice to do. So if it doesn't take longer, uh, to answer your question in a usual roundabout way, um, it, it, yeah, we, we would probably, if we did it again, we'd do it in probably three to four months for that passage. We talked to Paul and Cheryl yesterday about this, and for them to go from the north of France to the south, which I think is about uh, twice as far, they took eight weeks, and they said, yeah, we, think, we thought we'd rushed it at the time. So we did a month, we did it again, we would take probably three to four months, and these canal systems, they are extensive. It's not just France. The same canal system links Holland and Germany, so you can, and, and you can get to Scandinavian, so you can literally spend your entire life in these canal systems just enjoying everything. So, anyone else? Well, any other questions? Cheers. Gentlemen at the back. Um, that stone infrastructure, is that present outside of the locks, like in the whole system, or is it just, can you just, can you just say that again? I can speak a little bit. Yourself. So, like, it, are the canals stone lined throughout, or is it just in the lock? It's just, so it's just the locks. I think the thing about the canals is because they are hundreds of years old, they are heavily maintained. And what your money goes to, your permit money goes to, is maintaining the, the, canal, maintaining the canal system. The Canal de Midi is a, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, so there's a lot of money that goes into preserving it. So the lock walls are all made of stone. Um, the canal banks are mud and stone and I think a lot of the trees that were planted were just so that the roots would actually form um, just a, a natural barrier to stop them all collapsing, which, you know, it, it, it's a double-edged sword from that point of view because you, can, you do hit sunken roots and you can, kind of like the boat comes to a bit of a juddering halt as you get close to the bank. So, yeah, so it's mostly stone in the locks, outside of that mud. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yeah. Yes and no. So what our, our biggest concern was always that in the middle of this canal system where there were very few mechanics, especially Yanmar mechanics, something would go wrong and we'd be stranded. Thankfully it didn't happen. Um, because our boat has twin rudders, uh, we cannot steer the boat in close quarters without a bow thruster. So if our bow thruster goes, we, we're, stuck, we're dead in the water. Uh, and that is unfortunately uh, one of the limitations of a, a twin rudder boat. We got through without any problems, with the exception, I think we were two locks from the end. I think we, we, we were, literally, we, we had a, a lock out of the canals at three o'clock in the afternoon. At one o'clock, we went through a stretch between two locks that had no trees. And you, the reason that that was a problem was because the trees provide shade and we got entangled in a massive algal bloom. Um, and it's that, it's, it, the, the, the weed is like candy floss. And it just, it gunged everything up. So it blocked the motor and it also blocked our rudders and the bow thruster. So we are literally um, unable to move. At that point we, we lost steerage, we then ended up going into the canal bank, albeit very slowly, which in itself is fine, but the algae was thicker there. And literally, I, I think that was the most panicked moment we had. We're like, we're gonna be stuck here for a while. Um, Teresa, you know, valiantly jumped off the boat and tied us up and I valiantly stripped off and dived in and tried to just uh, just literally pulling handfuls of this weed off our riders. It took about half an hour, and you know you come out looking like a swamp man, you know, covered in green, you know, smelling like a swamp. And uh, you know, Teresa saying, "You took your time." <laughs> so uh, we managed to get through that. Okay, we got out, and we actually one of the reasons our boat is still in France is because we we got to the marina at the end of our trip and um, we went to set off for the UK. Like a, this was about a month after we got, you know, finished the canals and the gearbox backed up. And we're like, it's, there's a, so we had to have a gearbox rebuilt. There's a, something, a component in a, in, a, in a marine gearbox called a clutch cone and they wear. And I think we'd spilled, we motored for 200 hours in the, in the canals. So that had to be replaced. So in the answer to your question, did your gearbox, did you have engine problems? No, but we had to have the, the gearbox rebuilt afterwards. And then the second time we left for the UK, the bath was packed up. Uh, so we had to have that fixed as well. So um, whether the canals caused those problems, probably not. Did they contribute to them? Yes, they probably did. Does 
Does anyone have any questions for Teresa? Because I'm just talking until it gets done. <laughs> yeah, gentlemen with the, yeah. Are there any storage facilities if you need to wait out a visa for three months or something? Chase Charles? The canal goes through several major towns. So it goes through Toulouse is the biggest town, and then there's some smaller towns along the way. And you could take advantage of whatever storage, um, you know, storage units or whatever they they offered there. Uh, France is just like any other country; they have all sorts of, you know, you could put something in a storage facility there. Um, there are uh, boatyards, obviously at either end, um, who offer storage, particularly for obviously boat parts. Uh, that's how we would have dealt with our masts being transported. The, the, the yard would have stored the mast for us for however long it took um, for us to get there. So yeah, there, there would be a solution to that um, that issue, I'm sure. Uh, for, for the boat itself too? Oh, sorry, uh, for the boat itself, yeah, you can. There's loads of places that you can st you can leave the boat, uh, kind of long-term docking along the way, yep. And plenty of boats actually never move. They have been sitting there for probably years. In fact, many of them are too big to go through the locks and they have to literally be cut in half in order to be moved through the next lock. So yeah, there, there'd be an opportunity to leave your boat on route. Just, just to re-emphasize that, we met a, an Australian couple that had been going for seven years in the same stretch of canal. Uh, they were retirees that actually lived in Australia and their summer was to take their canal boat um, through a stretch of canals and then they'd go away and come back. So yeah, uh, storage is, is, is everywhere. Um, dry storage or wet storage uh, and all I would say is that it, it is I mean we I think the most expensive marina we've ever been in because obviously we, we've been cruising for a while now uh, after Turks and Caicos I think was uh, a slip in Florida which was eye-watering but I would say that the storage in uh, in the French canals was some of the cheapest we've ever seen I mean you know, put it this way to get a mast taken off a boat in a, in a yard so uh, it was four nights accommodation four nights electricity, four nights Wi-Fi, and having the mast unstepped by a mechanic and stowed on deck, uh, $40. Yeah, you try getting changed, that's the tip that I would give the, 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 the dock hand in Charleston for uh, the FedEx. So the costs are significantly less, and I would say that probably uh, the canal costs are at least half what the maritime costs would be on the coast. So it is super cheap. And boats are super cheap as well. Yes, sir. Because of, did you guys ever see any other cruising couples that left their boat, you know, at the base of the canal and either rented a smaller boat or maybe they had a big tender that, that they would go and explore up and stay in town or something like that? Um, so, so you're saying, do people enter the canal system by uh, with, uh, in tenders? Well, yeah, I mean, not to say a tender, but if, if somebody carries like a 14-foot tender on board, you know, something capable for that they rent a boat to just experience the canal. I think, so, the, 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 the big thing for us when we went into the canal system was that, you know, when we're sailing, we normally uh, measure our distance and progress by, you know, the, the boat speed. So we'll do six knots, so if we're doing six knots for 10 hours, we've got 16 nautical miles under our belt. The problem is, when you're in locks, you measure the distance by locks. And so it's very difficult to go further past a certain amount of time, a distance, because you come up against a lock, and so there'll be locks every two miles or two kilometers, and you have to stop. And sometimes you can be held up for a few hours there. So to, you, to go into a lock system, the way that the French system works is, and it's, it's as French as you could possibly get, they open at nine and at 12 o'clock they stop for lunch. And that is like written into their constitution. Lunch is uh, sacrosanct. And then they open again from 1.30 till seven. So that, and then everything closes again. So you can't travel after those times. So during the day, you've got about 10 hours of travel. So you could go in and there was a chap that we saw who must have been at least 120 years of age, who, who had a boat that was about the size of our tender with a little outboard on it, and he was going through the systems on, on his own. He had like a little cuddy, and he would sleep in it, mean, you know, and so it can be done in a smaller boat. Uh, I think it literally depends on, you know, what level you are willing to accept. And one thing I would say about this, and I, we haven't touched on it, is that because all these canals were served by old canal boats back in the day where the canal boats were towed by horses, the French have turned all the tow parts into cycle parts. So the entire canal system is served by really, really well-maintained cycle routes. 
and there is a huge, in fact, you can look on Amazon, there's, there are books about cycling the French canals. Now, because, uh, I'm not sure, for those of you who know, there's pilgrimages that you can go up to Campostello, mm. like uh, for the pilgrims from, from Lourdes, one of those routes is actually through the French canal system. So there's a lot of these uh, French guest houses and hostels that um, will allow you to stay. So you can cycle it. And you can cycle because you aren't held up by the locks. If you cycle through the canal system, you can do 30, 40 kilometers a day. And what I was actually, because my parents are in their 70s, nowadays a lot of these uh, pilgrims are doing it on bikes, but doing it on e-bikes. So literally, they're not even pedaling, they're just like, you know, it's like the, the worst kind of easy rider impression you're going to want to get. But, so you can go, and at the end of the night, you can stay in a bed, get a hot shower, charge up your e-bike, and then go on the next day. And the thing about that part of France, especially the southwest where we were, is from about May to about September, you are guaranteed almost water or sunshine. So climate-wise, it's not oppressive. Like we've been, we were living in South Carolina in, in July, and that wasn't pleasant. Um, but the, so the climate, there's, you don't have the humidity, you have really nice weather. And so for those of you who are like, actually, I don't want to hire a canal boat, you can do it on a, on a push bike. And you can hire a push bike and stay in hotels and get the same, you see, exact, as you know, Brian was saying before, whether you've got an expensive boat or you've got a cheap boat, you all stay in the same anchorages, you all get the same views. So yeah, another way that we, you know, we would suggest is if you are, you know, if you want to experience it without kind of like taking a boat in or hiring a boat, if you are in that location, if you're in southwest France, you could go and hire a bike for a couple of three days, go and do a hundred kilometers of it, book some, you know, some pensions or hotels along the way, and do it that way. Okay. Yes? So the wood stakes that you made to tie up to didn't really look that secure for yourself? So um, the problem, this is, this is, so, so the, the, the question was, our, our wooden stakes didn't look that secure, uh, our tied up. So where we started all this, we were going to transport our mast. That was the entire thing. We were going to transport the mast. We weren't going to build A-frames. We were just going to do it on our own. And because that fell through, the, the mast company just said, look, we, we can't transport your mast for five weeks. And we're like, we don't have five weeks. So we then had to run around getting all our things ourselves. And uh, the error on my part, I think as Brian said, like sailing is all about making mistakes and learning from those mistakes. We could not find the tools and the equipment we needed to, to get that tied up. So we went into the canals initially with the biggest metal stakes that we could find, which were about a foot long. Uh, they were woefully, woefully inadequate. So we then, I bought two fork handles, um, which they worked really well because really we had a, a four pound sledgehammer you know, if you've got a three foot, two, three foot stake and you drive it 18 inches, two foot into the ground, it isn't going anywhere. And we would always put one line out of the tree root so that if everything went haywire, we would always have a safety line. Not no, not the tree trunk, a tree root. The tree roots protrude into the river or into the canal. So yeah, they weren't as sturdy as I would want to be. And we found a couple of other stakes along the way, which we um, gave back to nature when we left. So, the, and, and the thing about it is, because it's a canal system that goes, in our case, from south uh, to uh, southwest, you meet people coming the other way. So from the point of view of repurposing things, we met uh, another cruising couple in a sailboat going the other way. We gave them our ray frames, we gave them all our cargo straps, so that they had, and you know, because for a lot of us doing this, you are doing it for the first time and you're really trying to learn as you go along. So we're like, look, take this, take that, take our cruising guides, take all this. and. Hopefully, when they got to the other end, they'd have given everything to someone else. So, um, and I think they say this about Panama and other canal systems. When you get to one entrance point, you'll find all the debris from the people that have left their stuff, and they'll give it all away. So, yeah, the stakes weren't as good as they could have been, but you know that's what we had, and we had to deal with uh, things as best we could. Any other questions for Teresa? <laughs> no, I think it's probably lunchtime. Yeah.